Welcome back, everyone. Um, let me introduce our keynote speaker, Harrison Hong. Harrison is the John Akko Jr. Professor of Financial Economics at Columbia University. Uh, he received his PhD in economics from MIT. Before joining Columbia, he was the John Scully 66 Professor of Economics and Finance at Princeton University. And he has contributed to a number of topics in financial economics, especially on behavioral finance and uh, stock market efficiency. His work on disagreements, bubbles and crashes, friction and arbitrage, and the corporate, corporate sustainability and climate change risks have been published in different top economics and finance journals. So today, uh, Harrison is going to give uh, a talk about uh, mitigating disaster risks in the age of climate change. Uh, Harrison, we have 40 minutes. Maybe you can talk for 35 minutes, and we have five minutes for questions. Great. Thanks a lot. Right. Um, thanks for everyone for sticking around. Uh, so uh, I put a talk together uh, that is predominantly based around uh, some new work I'm doing with uh, Nang Wang at the uh, Columbia uh, Graduate School of Business and uh, Jin Chan Yang at uh, the Shanghai uh, University of Finance uh, on, on, of course, on disaster risk. Uh, but the talk itself, I'm going to try to uh, be a bit broader uh, than, than, than that paper and just reflect on this very horrible year that we're all living through. I mean, obviously you have the pandemic and I think in the US, you know, for the second year in a row, the Western US states have these wildfires. And I think we're currently going through in the Atlantic, uh, probably I think we're gonna break the record for the number of hurricanes uh, uh, this year. Um, so let, let me start with uh, just a statement that, you know, I think in, uh, in the last few years, um, climate scientists have, I think, predominantly now converged on the view that climate change is uh, making weather disasters uh, more severe, and, and that, like, you know, going forward, uh, it's likely going to uh, be even worse. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the last couple of papers in the PNAS on uh, increased frequency and severity of Atlantic hurricanes, you know, I read some papers in 2005. Uh, I think there was a lot more debate, uh, certainly about the frequency whether or not climate change was leading to, uh, global warming was leading to kind of more frequent Atlantic hurricanes. But I think that that ship is now, has now sailed. Uh, I think there's now reasonably more consensus that uh, you have potentially some pretty bad states out there uh, in the future if, if, if there's no mitigation or if there's no, uh, if, if global temperature is not controlled. Uh, certainly in the Western US wildfires, um, there's now pretty good evidence, uh, especially in um, the states of California, Oregon and Washington that you know these these droughts that um, are linked to climate change are, are having a pretty severe uh, consequences for, for these US wildfires. And, and we know that you know from, from models of, of uh, you know disasters and macro that the welfare loss of, of, of such events are, are likely to be high. Uh, so just think about typical terrible hurricane events uh, that you know in the Atlantic uh, you know kind of like some extreme events are like one to two percent of Atlantic housing stock, right? Uh, once every 40 years. And if you look at kind of the models that, you know, Barrow and, and my, my, my co-author, Nung has done with Pindike, uh, you know, these, these sorts of disaster models can generate a pretty high uh, willingness to pay to avoid uh, these disasters for two reasons. And first, uh, the shocks are, are permanent uh, because they'll destroy some capital. Uh, so think about, you know, hurricanes and wildfires, for instance. And second, of course, uh, are, are risk preferences uh, that, you know, I think if we take seriously uh, some of the stuff uh, people have done in uh, macro finance, uh, you know, risk preferences, uh, plus these permanence of these shocks suggest uh, pretty high welfare losses um, going forward. And I think kind of the, our entry into this is that, and I think climate scientists kind of understand this, is that, you know, I think most of our preoccupation of thinking about climate change research has been, and I think rightly, on emissions control and carbon taxes at a global level, uh, which are of course, you know, very important. Um, but at the same time, you know, even if these things were implemented, um, you would still basically have many decades where you have to still deal with these disasters. I mean, it's not as if, you know, uh, uh, emissions control is gonna suddenly uh, turn the world back uh, per se, you know, in a very uh, a short period of time. And so, so our view is that you know, probably more research. I think it's, you know, relatively speaking, more research needs to be done on regional level disaster mitigation. 
uh, in thinking about the costs and benefits of that going forward. Because you know, it's gonna these these sorts of mitigation activities will likely play uh, a key role. Okay, so you know, there's there's just there's uh, some some key questions that we'll uh, try to focus on. So uh, first is what what determines mitigation, of course. Uh, second is what are the welfare loss with and without mitigation? Okay, and and I think that the contrast of the two is super important. And then finally, you know, what are the tax and asset pricing implications? Okay. Um, so this is the paper. Uh, I mean, it's still kind of undergoing some some revision, but I think we're kind of converging on a draft that 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 is readable. Uh, so this is sort of what what we try to do. Um, we're going to propose a model of regional level mitigation, where mitigation spending essentially limits fat tail damages to to capital stock along the lines that I've sort of talked about earlier. Uh, there's going to be two features that we think are important uh, in terms of uh, quantifying uh, uh, these, these, these effects. So first is uh, when a disaster arrive, arrives, that's going to change uh, the perceived risk of households, and that's going to change then the value of mitigation. Okay, so I think kind of one of the things that, that's important to point out is that going forward as we do these, these, these calculations and trying to figure out welfare laws, I think there is naturally going to be a lot of learning uh, by society going forward. Just look at the last 10 years, for instance. And I'll talk a little bit about that. You know, I think that the scientific consensus on hurricanes in 2005, as I said, was mixed, but the last 15 years or so, you know, that consensus has changed as more evidence has arrived uh, to, to inform and to refine uh, the climate models. Uh, second, of course, uh, the model also features, and I think this is important, an under provision of mitigation in competitive markets due to externalities. Uh, John Hasler, who's uh, discussed in earlier papers, has done some, uh, sort of important work on this in the context of emissions controls. Uh, there's gonna be a similar notion of, of externalities when it comes to uh, uh, the provision of mitigation, such as seawalls, et cetera, okay? So what we're gonna use the model for uh, is to quantify, I'm gonna do an application. Uh, the model could be, is, is fairly generic in the sense that it could be applied to a, a number of different scenarios. But just to make things very concrete, uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna focus on quantifying uh, the value of mitigation in terms of seawalls, uh, to guard against more, more frequent Atlantic hurricanes, okay? So I'm gonna imagine the model is about uh, these Atlantic hurricane states, which is about 40% of US GDP. And so uh, that, that, that they realistically uh, need to deal with these issues going forward. And we calculate, and we're gonna focus particularly on housing stock, uh, just to make things much, much more concrete again. Uh, so we calculate some willingness to pay to avoid hurricanes, something on the order of 25% of housing stock. And I'll, I'll talk about the scenarios. That, 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 that we're uh, calculating. Uh, the value of mitigation of these seawalls uh, is about 15%. So that is, you know, you're gonna do significantly better, essentially, uh, with these mitigation activities. To fund the seawalls, it's gonna be one and a half percent of the housing capital tax to fund the mitigation uh, is, is on, on kind of an ongoing basis, an annual tax, on top of whatever, of course, taxes that. And, 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 and the Atlanta coastal property in a competitive setting is about 8% too high. Uh, compared to the first pass, right? So, so that's kind of the economics I'm going to articulate uh, uh, in this talk. And then I'll, I'll, I'll try to use some of these numbers to guide uh, some of the recent work on uh, trying to understand the relationship between housing prices and, and, and these codes and, and climate risk. All right. So there, there's, I mean, I think sort of the broad goal that, that, that we want to do is, is, uh, is related to some estimates that, I mean, and certainly this is in the literature. So if you read uh, scientific journals like Nature and Science, uh, there are a lot of estimates about uh, these, these, these long run damages associated with these disasters. So in that sense, you know, uh, we're not, we're not going to be the first people to give you some estimates. But I'm going to point out, I think, some, some, a few things that are very, very important. So let, let's take probably uh, among the most famous of the papers is the Shang Jina paper. Um, so they basically, the way, and I think typically most of the science papers, uh, model weather disasters, it's along something like a productivity shock that affects long run GDP growth. Okay. Uh, and I think this is kind of the wrong model, actually. Uh, certainly it's the wrong model to think about the US. I mean, it could be okay model for thinking about developing countries uh, because you know, there I think these uh, countries there are probably more fragile and I think there are these kind of long run effects. But I, I view that, you know, if you're gonna want to quantify these, these sorts of uh, disasters, these weather disasters, uh, sort of a disaster model is a lot better than a labor supply model where, you know, uh, some, some disaster affect long run labor supply and affect like long run growth, productivity growth. I just don't think that makes, you know, it, it, I think it's okay and it makes some sense and certainly you can kind of get estimates from that, but I think it's certainly useful to think about uh, uh, probably a more, um, a better model to, to, to match, I think, what's going on in the data.
So uh, for instance, the, the developing countries, the, uh, the Shanghai Dina estimates are something like the mean estimate is $10 trillion uh, globally, absent mitigation, and sort of what is called the business as usual thing. Uh, but of course, I think the other thing with these estimates is that the models of mitigation are not very good, right? which is super important to understand. Right, that uh, typically most of these estimates um, you know, are not really so focused. They're mostly focused on the business as usual. So I think you know, there's some value in the estimate, but I think kind of, you know, modeling the mitigation is actually fairly important. Okay, and, and, and as far as I can tell, there hasn't been too much work I think, on, on, on linking mitigation to kind of getting these numbers. And in fact, you know, in these models, in these estimates, the way people think about mitigation is that it's changing the path of temperature from a business as usual scenario, which I view as being pretty far away from what would realistically happen in a world of climate change is, you know, you should think about building seawalls, you should think about land use regulation, et cetera, okay? All right, so just that thing, make things super concrete. Uh, this is a picture of the Atlantic, Hur Atlant of the primary kind of Atlantic hurricanes, too, which is that sort of recently read up on. So there's about 46,000 miles on the Atlantic hurricane because of all the jaggedness. There are basically low-lying areas at risk of sea level rise and storm surges, okay? Um, and so in the last probably 120 years, there's been about probably two major landfall hurricanes per year. Okay, and then like the average of the top six most damaging hurricanes are about one or 2% of the housing stock in the Atlantic. Uh, so right now, let's just take that number to be about $17 trillion. Okay, and um, you know, you can quibble with these numbers a little bit. Uh, you know, NOAA produces these numbers. And my sense is actually on the, on the tail events, uh, the numbers probably are a bit higher uh, because basically, you know, the estimates are, are or, um, you know, we know sort of from lawsuits after the fact that, that the numbers tend to be kind of more higher than the official numbers. And here's, here's sort of the, the mitigation strategy that's on the table, which are these seawalls. Uh, this is a picture the New York Times produced. So in New York City right now, we're thinking about $119 billion seawall for about six miles. And so the seawall basically, it's a little bit outside uh, and, and, and I think this is the nice one. Uh, this is the one that I think the Netherlands use with some nice retractable gates and everything so that you, know, you can kind of mitigate these, these uh, storm surges, okay? Uh, there's, there are other estimates. And of course, on the table uh, is exactly what's called a high tide tax. Like who's gonna pay for the seawall for the Atlantic region? Uh, so there's a report out that has some other estimates for a seawall. They're, they're, they're a little bit cheaper, probably $15 million per mile. Uh, and if we just take these numbers and you amortize this, and I think typically the, uh, there's some depreciation, so you have to spend five to ten percent on maintenance on the seawalls. We're we're talking about proposals that are anywhere from about eighty-one basis points to about four percent of capital stock per year uh, for these types of mitigation activities. Okay, so the question is, you know, do these proposals make sense? Uh, you know, what 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 you know, how do we make sense of all these numbers, right? Um, to 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 relative to the risk that society faces. Okay. All right, so the model we're gonna do uh, will be the following. We're gonna do an AK model. Uh, some people in macro like it, some people in macro don't like it. Uh, I think actually for, for, for the purposes that we're doing, I think it's okay. Uh, so you can think about uh, K as, you know, capital stock, as it's housing capital stock, and what people consume in terms of output are these housing services, and A is some productivity parameter. So it's just it's a typical AK model, except for one thing we introduced, which is X, which is this mitigation spending. So you know, with these uh, output, you can consume, you can make some investments, you have to pay for some adjustment costs of, of capital, uh, and then the big thing is really this mitigation spending X. Uh, you can also deploy some of it um, to 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 have some of these seawalls. Okay. So the risk that uh, the economy faces will, 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 will evolve like this. So you're gonna get your standard uh, capital stock uh, equation that evolves, you know, you make some investments, capital stock grows, there's a little bit of a, some diffusion shock associated with, uh, you might think you know, some, some homes are just uh, gonna you know, be outdated and you need to replace it. And then the big thing is really this DJ process, this is a Poisson process that arrives where a hurricane arrives and then uh, you're gonna basically lose uh, some fraction, one minus Z of your capital stock. Okay, uh, so Z will be this, this recovery rate. And, you know, the way we'll kind of model uh, the, the, the damage will be that Z is gonna follow, um, this is this recovery fraction, it's gonna have some cumulative distribution function and some, some density function. Okay, and so Z is gonna follow some power law uh, that, that we'll use to calibrate um, the data. Okay. Uh, so there's gonna be two possible states of the world. So you can think about the good state as, as something maybe uh, in the past, 
okay? Uh, where you know, you're getting maybe one to two arrival rates of uh, hurricanes uh, per year. And the Lambda B will be the bad state, okay? Uh, and and these, these two states are absorbing states. And so there'll be some learning that goes on based on the arrival of these disasters about what state of the world that we're in, okay? Uh, otherwise, standard adjustment, uh, capital adjustment cost function, uh, that, that's, uh, that's, that's widely used. Um, and the mitigation technology will work like this. Um, so you're gonna get some recovery fraction Z. The more you spend on mitigation, the more you get the recovery of your capital stock when a hurricane arrives, okay? Uh, and the way we'll kind of parameterize it is in the following way. Uh, the density uh, or, the, or the CDF of the recovery distribution is gonna depend on your pre-jump uh, uh, spending, uh, little xt minus. Uh, that's going to be basically just your, 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 your mitigation spending divided by uh, the, the pre-jump capital stock. And the way we sort of parameterize the, the function is that if the mitigation spending doubles, the benefit of mitigation also doubles, okay, which seems sort of reasonable. Uh, and then the domain of the recovery distribution, uh, the recovery variable between zero and one. Uh, otherwise, we'll use uh, a, a sort of the standard um, epstein zine recursive utility. Uh, and uh, as I'll talk about, this is predominantly very important uh, because we want to get some risk preferences that, you know, we have a sense for as being sort of realistic. Uh, again, the most important parameter here will be this, this, uh, this side uh, parameter, the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, which, which is mostly important actually for asset pricing implications. It's not so important for, for the welfare loss calculations, as I'll point out uh, in, a, in, a, in a second. Okay. So let, let's talk about the solution. Uh, so first, you know, you solve the filtering problem. Um, the reason we, we chose, of course, uh, this, this sort of a Poisson learning process is, is, is two things. First, it's gonna make, keep the model fairly tractable. And, and second, we don't have to estimate any uh, parameters when it comes to, to, to the, uh, other than basically picking what's a bad, bad state scenario, lambda, lambda B, okay? Uh, so, so the way that the, the, the filtering works is that pi T, which is really, this is the main state variable. Uh, when a disaster arrives, you're gonna basically update on how likely now is the bad state, okay? And so learning model, of course, is gonna generate time varying stochastic arrival rates uh, as far as these hurricanes. So the point is that in some years, you know, you may think after a couple of arrivals, wow, you know, the world is really bad, but then, you know, maybe in some other years when arrivals have been, uh, have, have been less than what you expected, you might think maybe things are okay. This is all allowed in the model, right? Uh, when we do these, these welfare calculations, okay? Uh, so you can kind of calculate uh, pi uh, as a sort of a martingale. Um, and so the, the way the, the, the updating works is, you know, the second basically a disaster arrives, there's a jump in, in, your, uh, in your state variable pi, but otherwise when no, 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 no disaster arrives, uh, you're gonna just deterministically drift back uh, to your prior, okay? So this is a picture of how, how the updating is gonna work. Uh, the red dots represent the arrival of, of some of these hurricanes. And you'll see that, you know, uh, starting at a prior point one, you know, you start drifting down and then suddenly when a, a disaster comes, you pop up, okay? And then you kind of drift down again, and then you pop up. So if there's a cluster of uh, uh, arrivals, uh, you're gonna then basically kind of move up fairly quickly in terms of the learning process, okay? And this is completely rational and, 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 and Bayesian updating in a world where, uh, and this is I think kind of uh, important and, and I think relatively new to the literature, uh, disasters are discrete signals, okay? Therefore, this is the rational updating process. And kind of one thing to note is in the environmental literature, there's a lot of discussion of what's called overreaction after disasters arrives. Uh, but actually, I think that sort of is, is a little bit misplaced because I think in, 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 if people are updating on discrete signals, you should expect some degree, uh, just rationally, of, of the you call overreaction in the sense that if no other disaster arrives, people basically drift back down uh, in terms of, 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 of their views. Uh, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the learning. I think there's actually a number of interesting things in the learning model uh, that would be very informative for learning uh, to talking about the disaster and environmental literature, but, but that's not really the main goal of the paper. Uh, otherwise, you can write down your HAB equation. Uh, so, that, you know, the, the two new pieces, of course, is this pi state variable, and then, of course, the jumps, right, which will basically create uh, this change in the value function. And this is where you get a lot of the bite when it comes to these welfare loss calculations. But otherwise, you get your standard uh, uh, investment first order condition, uh, your usual one. The only new first order condition we're introducing is basically X to mitigation, which is essentially you're going to choose mitigation such that you, you equate the marginal benefit uh, of mitigation with uh, the cost of consumption, of course, 
And the, 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 the interesting thing is that basically by changing apps, you're gonna change uh, the aggregate risk uh, uh, in the economy, okay? So you can view this as a first order condition from the, from the planner's perspective. And you can also view this as we model mitigation as an externality in the sense that uh, individual households are not gonna want to do any other stuff, right? Because of, of this externality. Um, just to kind of make things a little more concrete, uh, we'll model uh, the recovery distribution Z as a power law. Uh, so basically it's gonna be Z to the beta X. So X is controlling the beta, which is governing basically your, 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 your uh, recovery distribution. Uh, so a couple of key, key notations, L pi will be your expected capital loss per jump. Okay. And then G will be your growth rate. And so what happens in the economy is that when, when, uh, when a disaster arrives, you're going to lose some fraction of your capital, right? And then your growth rate then, uh, your, unex your unexpected growth rate then will just be your investment minus then uh, how frequently these disasters arrive and the conditional loss per jump. How, how many jumps you have and the conditional loss per jump. So all the formulas are fairly nice and transparent, uh, you know, relatively easy to sort of work with. And then we're gonna make things a little bit more for calibration and quantitative purposes. We're gonna work with beta X as a linear function. So, so that then we only have to calibrate really kind of two parameters, uh, beta zero, which is in a world without mitigation. And then basically beta one, uh, which is the, the, the mitigation parameter, okay? Um, and then for the capital adjustment cost, we're gonna just assume standard convex adjustment cost, all right? And finally, let, let's talk about the value functions. So in this setup, you can still keep all the nice properties uh, so that the, the model is essentially uh, highly tractable. You don't have to deal with PDEs. You're mostly dealing with still ODEs and you can get the value function for mitigation. Uh, the big thing is little B pi, which is the certainty equivalent uh, with and without mitigation. So this is B pi and then B hat pi, right? And it's telling you basically how your value function is changing as your perceived risk changes with pi, uh, both with and without mitigation. Okay. Um, there's a market failure in the model. So the competitive equilibrium solution is not corresponding to the planner solution unless uh, there's no mitigation technology that's available, right? Uh, so, so the welfare theorem don't hold in this model uh, and the uh, SDF of the mitigated economy and the SDF of the competitive economy are not the same. Okay. Uh, so, so therefore, uh, um, and the reason is just we, we model the mitigation as reducing aggregate risk, which itself is basically building in this externality. You could, we have in the, in the paper, of course, you can also basically make mitigation a non-externality as well. Um, but I think the, the interesting thing for us is, is really the externality aspect uh, that reflects with these sea walls and, and, and whatnot. All right, uh, and then finally, uh, we're gonna calculate welfare loss. So there's just kind of two notions. So one is the welfare loss is, you know, how much does your welfare change as your perceived risk changes, uh, both with and without mitigation. And then the other, the bigger thing we wanna calculate is really the value of mitigation, right? So we can compare basically how much money would you really be willing to give up for mitigation? Okay, so this is this, this zeta pi uh, uh, number. Okay, so we're gonna be interested in calculating uh, tau pi, tau hat pi with and without mitigation and then the zeta pi, okay. All right, um, I think for this type of models, actually, this is fairly, no, it's not that many parameters, so I can kind of talk you through, through it. Um, so for, first thing is the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. This, as I said, this, this parameter uh, is, is probably more important for the asset pricing than, than anything else. So we'll, we'll, we'll set it to 1.1. Probably a natural benchmark is something like one. Um, and, you know, in the long run, the risk literature guys try to, you know, jack it up to 1.5. Uh, I think our perspective is 1.5 is, is, is probably, is, is probably most macro guys probably think it's a little bit too high, a little bit too crazy. Uh, something around one, uh, maybe kind of okay. Um, then the power law exponent with no mitigation, we're going to set beta zero to be 246. So what this means is um, you're going to get uh, uh, um, conditional on the arrival of, this is to match the fat tail of the hurricane distribution. So, so that, um, you know, per jump, uh, it's about a 40 basis points of, uh, of, of damage to capital stock. Uh, so which is sort of reasonable given historical data. Uh, we're gonna set, just to be conservative, we're gonna set Lambda G to be one. So uh, there's kind of one major hurricane in the past. This is like the good state. This is like the, the before climate change and then, of course, climate change means 
we're still learning about where we will be. So I'm gonna set lambda b to be 10 is sort of like the worst parameter you can think of. Uh, and then of course, pi will moderate where we are uh, in terms of, 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 of how bad uh, uh, global warming is. Now, the time rate of preference productivity, quadratic adjustment cost parameters, coefficient of relative risk aversion, capital diffusion volatility, we're going to target these to match uh, these moments of the risk free rate, housing return risk premium, housing market volatility, expected growth rate, and Tobin's Q in the housing market. Okay. Uh, and then finally, the mitigation technology, the way we'll do it is we're going to pick beta one such that in the good state, you don't spend any money on mitigation. Okay. So, so that basically kind of tells you how uh, it, it helps pin down sort of how efficient is the mitigation technology, right? Okay, so let's talk about the numbers then. Uh, so I think that's sort of the main, the main point is to get some estimates of these hurricanes. Uh, on the x-axis is pi, that's our mainstay variable, okay? Um, first thing, let's talk about the red line. The red line is the competitive economy, okay, with no mitigation. So um, as I said, you know, we've calibrated so that one hurricane means about 40 basis points conditional on a hurricane is about a 40 basis point damage to capital stock on average. Of course, there's a fat tail. Um, so if we think about the world as, you know, let's think about where we are right now in the world, which is maybe like a 0.2 or something where we think, you know, it's bad, but you know, maybe not super bad yet. Um, you're still getting a pretty substantial drop uh, in terms of welfare. So, so you know, the red line you're dropping without mitigation is like uh, almost 0.3 at, at, at a pi of 0.2. Um, and then the growth rate, you're beginning to basically see growth rates now that will be uh, uh, affected because of these arrivals of these disasters. Now, if you mitigate, okay, uh, you do a lot better, right? Uh, so, you know, at 0.2, your, your value of mitigation is something like, you know, 0.15. Uh, this is a zeta pi parameter. It's just telling you that, you know, you would, uh, forgo 15% of your capital stock, uh, basically, for, for, for some value of mitigation. It's just really the difference between the blue line and the red line. Okay. So, uh, and of course, the value is that you're, you're, you keep your growth rate higher because you're basically mitigating against, you know, these big, these, these, these bad telemets, right? Uh, so your conditional damage really drops a lot, essentially, right? It drops you from 40 basis points per hurricane to about, you know, 20 basis points per, per hurricane of, of capital stock. Okay. And uh, agents with, uh, with these Epstein's in preferences really, really value, okay, uh, uh, this type of mitigation, all right? Uh, so, so I think these are new numbers, uh, just to kind of flag it. So what does that mean, you know? So, so if, you're, if you're gonna have 15% of um, uh, 0.15, you can think about that as 0.15 of uh, $17 trillion. That's sort of the value being generated by this, this, this seawall technology. Okay. Which I think is a kind of a new estimate that that I think is what we're bringing to the literature. So now let's think about um, the other uh, more finer aspects of the of the calculation. So X is is the mitigation spending as a function of pi. X is also the tax rate. Right. Okay. Uh, so so basically X pi is basically at point two. Uh, you're talking about like a one percent housing tax to fund the mitigation. All right. Um, one thing to kind of is kind of interesting to know, right? So of course, uh, because you're paying for mitigation, you're going to invest less, and and of course, the externality here is that building coastal homes, right, exposes the aggregate economy to a lot of risk, right? So you should tax basically these homes, and fund mitigation, all right? So so coastal property then, of course, uh, relative to the competitive equilibrium, is going to be too high. Right. Coastal property prices are just too high in the competitive equilibrium compared to the, the planner's equilibrium. Um, so some of the numbers we have, just a few th things. So the 1% tax is obviously non-trivial for a lot of homeowners. But what's interesting is that actually uh, the implications for home prices, which is captured by Q, is actually fairly modest. And the reason that's the case, of course, is that when people talk about taxes and all of this stuff, they mostly say, oh my God, you know, I'm going to get a tax. They forget about all the benefits that the mitigation gives you, right? which is it severely reduces risk. It improves welfare quite a bit. And actually, you know, the asset pricing implications are surprising that this is something we had learned in the model uh, because I think there's a lot of discussion in policy curve circles about all the bad things that will happen to financial markets should you have some taxes. 
But I think that misses like half the calculation, which is there's also a lot of benefits associated with that relative to the unmitigated economy. Okay. Uh, but of course, there, there will be some price effects, right? But, but you know, those price effects have to basically be uh, uh, offset by the benefits associated with that. Now, um, we've picked uh, at the Psi, so these results is super sensitive to Psi. These results are not, uh, you know, because of the welfare results are not so much. Uh, but basically, these these asset pricing results are super sensitive to size. Uh, and I think we we pick numbers that I, I, I kind of plausibly believe. Uh, um, uh, so this, 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 you know, I, I don't think like so. Basically, what happens is if you if you go for a very high side one point five, both lines will be really downward sloping. And I I don't think that makes too much sense. I think in this current context, uh, I think that was used to mostly match the uh, equity premium puzzle literature. Um, but I, I find that this sort of a different exercise. I mean, I think we learned something qualitative from the exercise, which is the importance of psi. But I think kind of realistically, this is probably a, a reasonable calibration. All right, so, so what, what are some takeaways for, for the empirical research? So one, one thing that the model does, of course, is that in reality, the world is probably somewhere between the red line and the blue line, right? If people anticipate some ability, right? Uh, some tax in the future, okay? Uh, so, you know, um, what, what the model says is that, you know, the actual behavior will probably be depending on the beliefs. So, so I think kind of the, the first comment about this plot is that actually more important in terms of household beliefs is really what they think about the taxes and when it will arrive, as opposed to necessarily uh, the risk of these hurricane arrivals per se. Okay. Uh, uh, if you kind of look, if you, if you kind of take these numbers seriously. Uh, so you can kind of calculate then kind of the, the red line is like a competitive market pricing for these homes, blue is the planner, and then you can calculate then, uh, if, you, if, you, if you also allow for some anticipated arrival rate of taxes, you can then calculate the value uh, and the actual value of capital with optimal taxation. Um, so let, let me um, make a, a couple of other comments. So I'm gonna to try to relate this. So Jose Shankman and, and Andrew Coley and I have published uh, a climate finance issue. And, and I think several of the papers were exactly about housing prices and climate risk. Okay, so I wanna use this model to clarify a little bit of the results in some of those papers. So typically my understanding uh, of, of the papers, at least what I edited, is that the, the, the regressions trying to link sea, trying to link home prices to sea level rise have typically given very muted results. I think that is consistent with our model in the sense that um, you could say that that's consistent with, 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 with this cube right here, right? That, you know, um, unless you thought there was going to be a huge amount of, of unless I was going to be really, really big, right? Uh, for reasonable values, this is sort of what you're getting. And even if you impose a tax, which is what a lot of people talk about, uh, the effects are still not going to be enormous because basically, uh, even if you go from a zero to a one, you're talking about the max, uh, price effect is something like 8%. Exactly because there's a lot of offsetting benefits, right? So, you know, detecting 8%, you know, I'm not sure exactly uh, um, is doable, but I think these, I think the model offers some guidance in thinking about what ballpark numbers we should be really getting when we run these regressions to begin with, right? Okay, um, I think, you know, so the, the papers are, I think, are very mixed. I think nobody's getting a very strong price effect even though the New York Times keeps wanting to publish papers about how there's these mega price effects. Uh, but I'm not sure that if you write down like a, a, a fundamental model, you should be getting such, such huge price effects because there's a huge amount of benefits uh, associated with, 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 with mitigation. Okay. Um, and then I'm, I'm gonna close with, 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 I think kind of some comments from COVID. Um, you know, I think basically when Nung and I and Jin Chan started working this year, we started working on uh, uh, this, this paper we've talked about and then kind of COVID came and then we sort of talked, you know, we have we worked on a bunch of papers on COVID. And I, I thought that I learned quite a lot about having spent like really almost a whole year thinking about mitigating disasters, you know, whether it's like a pandemic or like a hurricane. Um, kind of, I'll, I'll kind of reflect a little bit and, and, and kind of say, say a few of the lessons that I felt like I learned. Uh, first, I think, of course, you know, COVID's a bit easier because there's no two year fix for climate change. You know, in two years, we're gonna get a vaccine and, and you know, that's like a little bit like a climate moonshot and then things are over, right? Uh, so in this paper we have um, on, 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 on in the RFS, we look at kind of optimal mitigation strategies by firms to, to minimize the damage 
of, of um, COVID on, on, their, on their earnings, you know, you know, just to keep their workers from being sick and, and whatnot. And sort of one of the things we learned is that, you know, uh, if the vaccine is very far away, you know, people are much more aggressive in, in mitigation uh, than if the vaccine were closed, basically. And then I think that this sort of makes a lot of sense. I think there's like a similar a parable that, if you will, for thinking about mitigation and, and um, uh, climate change in the sense that I think, you know, the, 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 the ability of emissions uh, taxes, the ability of some technology uh, to really uh, control or reverse where we are in the climate, uh, there's, there's, there's no two-year fix, right? And, you know, this is kind of really, really far away. And so what that means, of course, is that uh, we need to think a lot more about uh, other types of investments we have to make in terms of mitigation, whether it's like seawalls and, 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 and other things. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. Open up for questions. Perfect. Uh, let me first check with the panelists and see whether any of the panelists want to ask a question. So please raise your hand and then we'll ask you to unmute. Okay, so maybe I can go ahead to ask the first question where the others are still uh, thinking about. What do you think about the belief of heterogeneity when you uh, try to make the decisions for the uh, mitigation? So I think it applies to the disaster risk and also people's expectation about uh, the risk from COVID and uh, how much help they are going to get from vaccine. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think the model obviously can um, can talk to that in the sense that it's, um, you know, I mean, let me show the, show the plot again. So the way I think to kind of talk about miscalibrated household beliefs, of course, is um, show the screen. you can just read off of this plot. Um, right. So you can read off of this plot, the um, the beliefs part, right? So um, the x-axis is pi, right? And, you know, you can imagine the real world, is the world of science, maybe pi is a 0.5, but everybody thinks pi is zero, right? That, you know, we're not in a bad state, right? That, that we think we're like pretty safe. This then going along these lines, depending on whether you're in a competitive market economy world or in a blue world, will give you basically the impact of miscalibrated household beliefs on home prices. So, so for instance, you know, I think um, the typical narrative will be like, well, uh, if everybody thinks pi is zero, but the world is like pi equals one, how bad off are we in terms of mispricing? Well, this red line will tell you, right? Uh, and this model is actually not quite a lot. Now, of course, like I said, this is completely like just, just driven by EIS. Right. You can kind of make this thing bigger if you want. So, so I think in that sense, um, that that's kind of one, one, one. You know, well, we're back to sort of a little bit with 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 uh, 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 these these risk preferences. Uh, so depending on kind of the risk preferences you're getting, uh, you can have pretty modest effects on, on on home prices associated with with miscalibrated beliefs. Right. Now the other thing is really miscalibrated beliefs about which I think of course are correlated about taxes. Right, that you just may think that, um, you know, so you know, it's like it was, you just may think, well, look, you know, I know there's climate change, but you know, the world will never be able to get their act together about ever implementing any type of policy, right? right? Exactly. That we're always going to stay on the red line. Okay, so if you basically now have policy uh, disagreements uh, about the extent to which uh, uh, these taxes can come, you can get to generate definitely more action. Right, so that, that would be something like, you know, like I said, like 8% here, you know, which is not trivial. I mean, you know, I, I think it's not a small number, but it's also not like, you know, this, what the bottle is basically trying to give you is a sense of what the magnitudes are, uh, depending on, on, and of course you can pick your favorite parameters and, 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 and get different um, uh, uh, magnitudes for that. But does that make sense? So that, that's the way yeah, I would. Yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. All right, are there any other questions from the panelists? 
And I see that there are some questions from the Q&A list. So let me try to pick. Uh, so Charlotte Glasser asked you about the correlation, the correlated shocks from the increased uh, um, disaster corruption due to climate change and the pandemics. So when the two type of disaster interact, uh, how do we uh, interact, uh, in, uh, how do we interpret this? Oh, I see, interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, no, so Charlotte, I think that's a good, um, so yeah, so here I'll, I'll, I'll point you, um, um, so the, here I think in this model is only one disaster. Uh, Ian Martin and, uh, and Pendike have had other papers where they entertain multiple disasters. Uh, when you have multiple disasters, um, there, there's some other trade-offs that one has to do. Um, so I think that's kind of one, one answer is if we, we don't really have multiple disasters in our model, we only have one disaster uh, in this model. Um, but um, but I think it sounds like the question is also just simply about uh, just, you know, in, 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 in the data, right, uh, to what extent um, the resilience of different countries in terms of mitigating uh, these effects are correlated between like COVID versus kind of climate change. Um, I think the model, this is not such a great model uh, to talk about you know, uh, these, these, these sort of cross-sectional effects. Uh, I, I know that um, in the uh, environmental literature, um, when you talk about mitigation, I think historically the literature has, has focused on the question of whether rich countries are better or have more ability to mitigate than poor countries. Uh, and I think that people believe there that that is true. Uh, and that um, if you look at the impact of disasters, frequency of disasters don't really vary that much across countries. Uh, but of course, uh, the damages vary quite a bit per disaster, which I think people take to be uh, some indirect evidence that, that poor countries are less able to, to, to mitigate compared to, to rich countries. Um, I, I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, obviously this is not particularly the you, you could interpret our model in that way if you do the following thing. So, you know, beta one is, is the kind of the key parameter. You could say that, look, some countries are endowed with a better beta one than other countries, right? That would be able to generate some of the cross-sectional effects that you're talking about, right? That, you know, maybe some countries that are less corrupt are more efficient at mitigating, right? Per, per dollar uh, compared to, 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 to other countries. Uh, but I think kind of a more interesting model that you would have to integrate, I think, some, some other aspects which we haven't done in the paper, like, for instance, some financial constraints, and then talk about rel the relative importance of like a beta one effect, which is kind of some type of endowment of technology effect or some institutional, sometimes it's called institutional endowments of different countries uh, versus uh, 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 some other kind of uh, constraint, con con constraints that you might kind of model as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Harrison, for the interesting uh, keynote speech. And uh, this is the end of the session for today and also for the conference. So I would like to thank all the presenters, discussants, and uh, audience for the wonderful work. And I will hand over to Bo for a concluding remark. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you, Dong. Thank you, all the presenters. and. Um, and all the discussants and all the participants. This has been a great uh, conference. We were very disappointed. When I say we, I mean the ECGI as well as the team at uh, in Stockholm that we couldn't meet face to face, but this has worked incredibly well as a substitute. And it strikes me that there's a lot of interest in this topic. There's sort of a convergence of really rapid academic development. At the same time, the people outside academia are really interested in the topics. And this, the only time I can remember in my time in academia that I had that feeling was when I was a PhD student, right after the internet bubble burst, when all of a sudden everybody was very interested in how people are not rational and what happens when people are not rational. And, um, Interesting observation is that Harrison was at the forefront of that development as well. Um, 
anyway, that's, that was all I wanted to say. Thank you everybody for joining us. And I'm sure all the authors will look forward to hearing questions by email if you didn't have the chance to get a word in. And uh, with that, I wish everybody a happy rest of the Sunday. Thank you very much, Bo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you.